Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Heron's Haven podcast. That was I just. Hopefully, I wasn't listening to double, but I think I fixed it. No, I wasn't double. Okay. Anyways, welcome to another episode of the Heron Havens podcast. This is SoFlo Soccer, and uh, today we're doing the preview to Inter Miami versus Sporting Kansas City. Uh, we're gonna just gonna be talking. We're gonna be talking about a couple of different things today. Whether uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the last game against Monterrey, as much as I really don't want to. Uh, we're just gonna recap that just a little bit because I've talked about it in, in the match um, in the match review the night or literally a couple minutes after the game ended and uh, we're gonna talk about that then we're gonna shift into some rumors that's been lingering around with the club in regards to dre calendar matias rojas eh, sergio romero and things like that and then we'll do some uh we'll talk about some a scouting report uh from sporting kansas city and then i'll give my prediction on kind of what how the team should line up what we should be expecting from inter miami and my prediction on the result for tomorrow's game so without further ado let's just talk a little bit about monterey let's talk a little bit about our performance at mexico and how that's going to lead up to kind of the rumors that has been pretty much lingering around since yesterday um so yesterday or wednesday wednesday night we took a terrible loss right three to one three to one on the night five on five to two on aggregate um red card from jordi alba late in the game out of just pure frustration he was already getting pretty upset uh, a lot of players were pretty much ghosts um defense was in shambles Trey Callender played a horrific game. It was just not a good day to be a Miami fan, right? It was not a good day to watch Miami football. Um, And so, 
Monterrey wasn't even that much better, to be honest. They were just better than us. We were we just didn't show up to play the game, right? But anyways, it is what it is. I'm not gonna talk too much. Like I said, I'm not gonna talk about like the performance in general and whatever. It was just so bad. I've already talked about this before in the review, but I just wanted to just put this out there because Drake Calendar has been just in like everyone's just talking about Drake Calendar. Uh everyone's talking about Drake Calendar saying that he has to go uh that miami are rumored to release him and bring in another goalkeeper and i just want to kind of just give my input on that there's nothing confirmed right there's no official statement from anywhere these are just speculations uh from journalists like argentinian journalists and and whatnot reliable argentinian journalists right but if we look over to this, yeah, the Herons have quickly established themselves as one of the most exciting uh, projects in all of soccer, whatever, whatever, whatever. And they've reportedly offered a contract to former Manchester United player ahead of the summer transfer window, Sergio Romero. So according to the journalist, Martin Liverman, Inter Miami have made a contract offer to sign Argentinian goalkeeper and current Boca Juniors star, Sergio Romero, who has spent four years at the English Giants of Manchester United. Um... Yeah, ex-international player, ex-Argentinian uh, ex, uh, national team player, really helped us out in the 2014 World Cup. Um, you know, being just a penalty beast, he was just an absolute wall in the net. Um, yeah, and so Liren wrote the Twitter about Inter Miami's interest uh, in Romero being a bombshell in Boca. Bombazo en Boca, dicho al anterior... Me encuentra que Inter Miami quiere a Sergio Romero, arquero de Boca, y le ofreció un gran contrato. El arquero... Uh, can I view this too? Oh, there we go. Al arquero y su... Oh, all right. Al arquero y su familia le gusta la idea de vivir y jugar en USA. No reno... renovaría. Renovaría. No renovaría con Boca e iría a la MLS. Boca buscaría un arquero. And so pretty much saying that Miami have offered Sergio Romero a big contract, right? And Romero and the family were thinking about uh, moving to the U.S. because it's good for, for them and whatnot. Um, I did hear, I, I couldn't find it, but I'm pretty sure Romero has come out and said that he purposely i'm gonna to go to full screen for this one he's purposely spoke with riquelme right he he spoke with riquelme at boca juniors and he was like yo i'm not renewing my contract his contract is expiring at the end of this year when i checked when i checked on transfer market it said that in 2020 uh december of 2024 that's when his contract's expiring which is pretty much the end of our season and the end of the season in argentina um, he said that he didn't want to renew with Boca or that he wasn't sure yet. He doesn't know what the right decision is for uh, him and for his family, whether it's staying here, playing for Boca in Argentina or moving elsewhere, potentially the United States and potentially Miami, because that's pretty much the hotspot of anybody that anybody would want to live, right? It's nice here. The weather's nice. The houses are nice. Um, it's just an overall better environment. So, but like at the same time, right? So let, 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 let's, let's, let's step away from that news, right? And go into just opinions and common sense. I, in my opinion, in my personal opinion, I'm Argentinian. I'm an Argentinian American. I was born here, but I'm Argentinian. I love Romero. I have a lot of love for Romero and great respect for Romero for what he's done for the national team, for what he's done at Racing, and now he's doing great things at Boca. I respect him as a player, and I respect him as an Argentinian. But he is 37 years old. He's 37. So he's way past his prime. Way past his prime. I'm not saying... That he's not good enough to play in the MLS. Right? I'm not saying that at all. 
because he's good enough to play at Boca uh, at the top level at a re in a really competitive Argentinian league in a really competitive Boca side. He's good enough to play there and he's good enough to play in the MLS. But he's 37 years old and quite frankly, why would Inter Miami sign a 37-year-old goalkeeper and trade Drake Callender? It doesn't make any sense to me. Unless they keep Drake Callender and then bring in Sergio Romero to maybe have some experience in the group or something and maybe continue to mentor uh, and continue Drake Callender's training. Maybe that, but it, it makes, to me, it makes zero sense for for them to bring a 37 year old goalkeeper who may who, who will only play probably one season maybe two if like maybe two maybe two seasons but for what like for what i don't know i that's gonna take up an international slot i don't know how much of the salary cap that's gonna take i feel like it's it's too much for inner miami to to do that i i feel like it's 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 um it's not convenient it's not smart uh for them to bring in a player like sergio romero a 737 year old argentinian international player we don't know what his salary cap is going to be at like we don't know what salary he's going to be i just don't understand why would we waste an international slot on, on another goalkeeper i mean we have like we have i know we the, our only starter is drake calendar we have dos santos and we have jensen as the backups and those guys don't really jensen especially doesn't get any playing time he's the starter for the b team uh he doesn't get any game time for the for the starters for the for the first team uh dos santos has kind of slipped in there from like maybe two games three games i think i've seen him play for the first team done all right um he gets really passionate he really controls his box when he plays uh, he really that's like his area he takes good control of it and takes good care of it um he's played really really well for the b team for when i saw him last year um but yeah that's it like we don't have like pretty much any experienced goalkeepers except for drake calendar he's been here for i don't even know how long um but yeah uh, so yeah, I don't know. I, I personally don't, I feel, and then people are saying this and the reason why this is happening, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, is because Drake Callender had such a horrific game against Monterrey, which is completely obvious, right? Like it's, it's factual. It's not, that's not an opinion, right? Like that is complete facts that he has had a horrible game at, um, for Inter Miami against Monterrey. He's, he cost them the first goal, right? His distribution was awful. His uh, eagerness was not there. Like he kept, he every time that he was, he would receive the ball, he would try to slow down the play. And it's like when you're down one nothing and you're three one down on aggregate, you can't slow down the play. Um, you have to play out wide to the fullbacks and try to build some momentum. But they kept just passing around the back. They really couldn't get through. I feel like I, it, it looked like they were scared to just advance up the field. And Monterrey was doing a really good job um, holding it down and forcing them into certain areas and certain positions so then they could just pressure and counter. Suarez can play a keeper at this point. Now, to be honest, I'd probably prefer Suarez at a, go at a keeper. Um, I just closed out the freaking chat. There we go. It's 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 just re it was just really embarrassing, right? For especially Drake Calendar, but pretty much since that bad performance, people just kind of want him out immediately. And I'm like, at the end of the day, you have to think about think about what Drake Calendar has done for the club in its entirety, right? So Drake Calendar has been for the club for a long time. He's played a lot of games. He started a lot of games for the club, and I feel like I should zoom this out because like a little bit of my head is like cut off. Um, he's played a lot of games for the club. He's started. He's been the captain, I'm pretty sure, at some point. Off of one game, you want to completely sell him and bring in a 37-year-old goalkeeper who's going to take up an international slot and God knows what, um, how much they're going to pay him for, for maybe a year, maybe two, at most two. Doesn't make any sense to me.
That, so I, I don't, I like I said, I ro love Romero. I love Romero and I love what he did for the national team. But bringing in a 37-year-old goalkeeper for maybe a year, it doesn't make any sense. It, it genuinely, and to take up an international slot, it doesn't make any sense. So, um, I'm pretty sure Romero was supposed to join Inter Miami back in COVID, like back in 2020, 2021. He was supposed to join us. I forget what happened. I think we already filled up all of our slots or something because I'm pretty sure he was still playing at Manchester United at that time. So he was going to take up like, I'm pretty sure he was going to take up a DP slot as well because of his salary at the time. But now he wouldn't take up a DP. I don't know. It's a whole thing. Anyways. So yeah. That's on that, right? That, that's 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 enough about that, about Drake Calendar and about that Sergio Romero rumors. And my opinion on that, I think it's absolute BS. Um, in terms of making that deal happen, I feel like there was no like we have a 26 year old Drake Calendar, 37 year old Sergio Romero. Yes, the Romero can bring the experience and the passion and the leadership to the team. Um, especially when he's paired with the goalkeeping coach, Saha. Uh, a lot of good things can happen, right? But unless we find a way to get rid of somebody else, not Drake Calendar, to bring in Romero, I, I, I'm just not going to, I'm just going to be against that idea completely. But yeah, the other player that has been rumored for about a month now to join Inter Miami is Matias Rojas, former Racing Club player, and I'm pretty sure he played in Corinthians in Brazil. Did really, really well. He played for Platense, I'm pretty sure Lanús as well in Argentina, and he has he did very, very well for Racing. Um, and then ever since he joined Corinthians, he's been kind of declining. But for a side like Inter Miami, for a league like MLS, Matias Rojas would be a great signing, right? We have one international slot that we traded. We had we we bought an international slot. I forget what team we bought it from. We have an international slot. So we so we need to occupy that spot. If the if the wages, if the salary cap is good, if we don't surpass anything, like if we're not like illegally paying for players like we used to do in fucking 2020, then we should be fine. Then we should be taking up this international slot as soon as possible. As soon as the summertime hits, boom, take it. So they, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're still, they're, they're continuously talking with Matias Rojas and whoever else they would want to bring to bring to fill in this slot. But yeah, I think Matias Rojas would, I think would definitely boost the midfield attack because he plays like an attacking mid role. Um, so he would play, I'm pretty sure he's a lefty. So he would either play on that left or right hand side. And if he plays on the right, he'd be inverted. Plays on the left, Jordi Alba can, can pretty much assist. So imagine, literally imagine a team, right? The 4-4-2 formation. I, I'm so, I really want Inter Miami to play a 4-4-2. Because I feel like that would just be best. It, it literally, they've played it before. I've said it, I've, I'm saying, I, I feel like a broken record every time I say this. They've played it before. They've played it against, I believe it was Colorado. It was literally like two games ago. Not against Monterrey. It was the, it was in a league game before Monterrey. They, lay, they played the 4-4-2 in the second half. Or at least that's what they shifted into. And it worked. Like, it just it just worked. They were able to control the midfield. They were able to, to slow down the opponent and control the game. And not just allow space, and not, and not allow the opponent to find space between the defenders. I feel like it, I just don't understand why they can't just do a four four two. Because four four two, if Matias Rojas joins, right? If Matias Rojas joins in the summertime, and we're playing a four four two, we're having Drake Calendar and goal. The four center backs would be, or the four defenders would be Jordi Alba, Freire, Aviles, Cello. Matias Rojas, Gomez, Busquets, or Redondo, I guess, if he comes back. Redondo, Busquets, eh, Grasso, Suarez, and Messi up top. And then what's your bench? Cremachi off the bench, Gomez, Alfonso, Ruiz. 
Campana, Taylor, because at that point, I, I'm pretty sure they're going to be back at that point in the summertime. I don't know. I don't think uh, Robbie Robinson and them are going to be available at that time. Um, on, I don't think so. Let me I have the injuries pulled up right here. Expect so Facundo Farias is expected to return in August of 2024. So that is way down the line, that, and that's ex expectation, right? Because he tear, he has a crucial ligament tear. Um, Redondo's coming in May, right? He'll be back in May, so by the summertime he'll be fine. And even after the summertime, and after like Copa America and Euros, he's gonna be fine. Um, Kritsov is gonna be fine, I believe. By I don't know. Because it's just a muscle injury. So he's just kind of having to recover. So he'll be, he should be fine by the end of this month or by next month. Looks like everybody in the world realizes 352 or 532 doesn't work except that. that unbelievable. That's what I'm saying. Clara, literally, Luka Modric is coming also. Apparently, Luka Modric is, is rumored to come. Uh, uh, Sergio Ramos was rumored to come. I don't think Sergio Ramos is going to actually come because if Messi wouldn't allow that because it's Messi's team at the end of the day, right? But Clara, literally, I think that I was going to talk about Tata Martino later in the street, like later. But I mean, since we're talking about formations and how we can potentially line up, I think we should probably talk about it now, right? Literally, I don't, I swear, I looked up a statistic. I don't know where I saw it from, but it was on Twitter and it was a fan. It was a fan that published it. Um, It just showed us, it showed us a graphic of how many games we played with the 352 or 532 and it i think we've out of all of the games that we've played with the 352 532 we've only won once with that formation only won once with that formation anytime that we've won has been a 433 or some other formation it's it's like so i don't understand why data martino continues to force this position or uh, continues to force this tactic and this formation within Miami when he it, it clearly shows it doesn't work so I don't know if he's just trying to he's trying to force this mindset force this mentality force this way of play on the club when it clearly is not working and it's upsetting literally every single person and he doesn't on the field he's not showing any um any motivation to change He's not showing any motivation to change that formation. And it's it's so upsetting. Don't play the if you don't want to play 4-3-3, go 4-4-2. I don't know how many times I have to say it. Like, I don't know how many times. Like, I don't know if I'm the only one that's thinking this. Like about playing a 4-4-2 formation. We were literally structure-wise, we're lacking structure. Just play a 4-4-2. Figure out if you want to play 4-4-3 later, play it later. 4-4-2 until you figure out your structure. Then switch to a 4-3-3, switch to a 4-1-2-1-2, switch to a 4 up top, a 4-2-4. Do whatever you want. 4-4-2. Alba, Cello, Freire, Aviles. If Matias comes, we'll play Matias. Gressel, Redondo and Busquets, Sergio, um, Luis Suarez and Lionel Messi up top. If we don't play Matias on the left, we can play Taylor on the left. We can play Afonso on the left. We can play Jordi Alba on the left mid. We'll put Franco Negri left back. For the right back, we have Cello and Ruiz. Ruiz did well last time. The first time, he didn't do so good at right back. The second time he played, he did a lot better. So he's developing in that role. Play him as a backup right back. Play Noah Allen as a right back. I don't care. Um, Right mid, Gressel. Is, it's either Gressel or you can put Messi out on that right mid. And then you could put Campana and Suarez up top. It, I think there's, there's just so many possibilities, so many ways, so many tactics, so many formations, so many different positions that you can put these players in to make them play better, but they're not. He's forcing them in one way to play in one one way, one formation, and it's just not working at all. And the fact that he didn't make any subs against Monterrey, I don't care if we were down, like we were down two nothing. I believe he he was still not making subs. It was like the 60th minute. He should have made subs at the 60th minute, maybe 50th minute, maybe one or just just one or two, just to just to keep it fresh and maybe change the formation a little bit. 
nothing. 70th minute, nothing. 80th minute, nothing. Um, Gomez was dead. Aviles was dead. Or Aviles played a terrible game. Um, He could have been taken out. Suarez could have been taken out uh, for Afonso. Um, I don't know, man. Bring in Benjamin Kremaski. If, if Benjamin Kremaski... I don't know why he brought in Benjamin Kremaski if he wasn't going to play. Like, if if he's not ready yet, don't bring him. It doesn't make any... Bring players that you think that can play, that want to play, that can play. He probably wanted to play, but why didn't you play him? I don't know. It's... I can literally talk for hours about that. They play together at PSG, though. For Ramos? Yeah, I mean, they play together at PSG, but I, that doesn't mean I don't, I don't think... Messi would just want to reunite with him, like, willingly. I, I feel like if... Because literally, like... I feel like I feel like people forget that Ramos literally would break Messi's legs in La Liga in, like, Real Madrid versus Barcelona in El Clasico. Like, I felt like it was mad awkward. Like, it, it had to have been so awkward of Messi walking into the PSG dressing room, seeing Sergio Romero and, like... Or Sergio Ramos... And, uh, like, just saying hi, like, nothing bad ever happened. Like, nothing bad ever happened on the field. Like, Ramos didn't cause seri almost life-threatening in injuries. And I agree with you, not making changes at least to get to fresh legs in the 90th uh, against Monterrey was criminal. Absolutely criminal. And it's, it's, making, it's making it more difficult for me to defend Tata. It's making it more... Uh, because I'm, I've, I've been Tata in... Right, I've been Tata in, and I, 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 I'm never somebody that kind of bl blames the coaches and wants to get rid of coaches. Like for Phil, uh, for Phil Neville, when he was going through that rough patch, I was like, ah, I mean, like, yeah, I, maybe he's got to go, but at the same time, I feel like the player's not performing either. So it, it's like it's it's really, it it it, it it's just really difficult. Normally, you don't want to blame a manager, right? You, you don't want to blame a manager for everything, especially if the manager is, is really trying and trying to do something right. But it doesn't seem like that does doing anything. And he blames it on the situation with the injuries and the situation that the MLS has these rules that limit him, which sure is true. It makes sense. But at the same time, it's like, that's not the reason why you're losing though. Like let's, let's, let's be real here. That's literally not the reason why you're losing. Like, you're literally losing because you're not changing your tactic. You're refusing to, to to make any changes. You're refusing to make subs. You're refusing to to try new to try new things. He makes no effort to make the team better. And maybe behind the scenes, it's different. We're seeing it from the front. Maybe behind the scenes is different, but... On the field, on the pitch, he's not showing that. I don't know. Didn't seem like that. I mean, like, it didn't seem like it probably because he was in front of cameras. I'm just assuming the worst. Like, I'm just assuming the worst because if I was Messi and I saw Sergio, like, I had to join a club where a player was literally breaking my legs in El Clásicos every other freaking year, I would, I would be like, yeah, I would be all happy and whatever in front of the cameras just not to cause any beef. Not to create any drama, right? But, like, I wouldn't willingly want to be, like, willingly want to play with him again. Like, if like if I had to say, I'd be like, yeah, nah. I don't know. I mean, but maybe maybe he it doesn't bother him. Maybe he's moved on from it. And maybe Ramos is not like that, I guess, against him. But I don't know. Part of the job, part of the job is not literally breaking a player's legs. He did that just out of pure spite, out of pure hatred. But anyways, um, and so yeah, and now they're and and now they're MLS has came has come out yesterday. Uh, talking about the rule changes and how they want to implement not more DPS but more U twenty two initiative player slots. So you would have each each team right now would have has three DP slots and two U twenty two initiative slots. So they would change the rules so then you can have three DPS and 
three uh three u22s and if you end up with two dps then you can have four u22s they're trying to like help out with bringing in younger players for development and whatever right um people are not happy with the, with the changes that's probably the biggest change the other the other changes were like in terms of game and buying buying out contracts and shit that doesn't matter right um people were not really happy about that and that that literally brought it up he was like yeah unless if, if mls really wants to compete and really wants to be one of the best leagues in the world they can't they can't like do that like they can't they have to change the rules they they just have to change the rules um they're obviously the mls are just scared to avoid what happened with uh, the na the nasl back in the 70s and 80s when pele was here right they're afraid of folding the league after six years because everybody's just going to run out of money because everybody's going to be paying insanely crazy contracts for these big play big big name players right uh, or Van Dyke, if we get another DP sp uh, spot. I might be crazy. I'm not an expert at MLS rules at all. I swear DP slots are not tradable. Or am I crazy? Are DP slots even tradable? I'm pretty sure they're not tradable. Because every team can only have a max of three. I could be completely wrong. Like I, I was under the impression that DP slots are not tradable because then, like, teams, if if there are, what first of all, whatever team is not filling out all three D, all three DPS is really missing out. But if if was, if a club just didn't fill up their DPS, like I'm pretty sure they weren't able to trade them. I don't know. I really don't know. It's it's the MLS rules are so complicated. He'd be a great pick for a week team. At this point, anybody that is not prone to injury and doesn't suck. I mean, but... I mean... It gets a little more complicated than that, right, though? Because it's like... Especially with, with injury proneness, like... I feel like... The people... People underestimate the... I feel like people underestimate the MLS League in terms of its physicality. It's pure physical. It's not like the Premier League, but it's like it's physical to to a certain extent. Like it's just like everybody is aggressive in that league. Like everybody is just pushing and shoving. Um and so when they when they when there are big tackles and people tear ligaments and uh you know, they have muscle injuries, it's just like it really like it's really physically stressful so it's like i feel like it's going to be bound to have a lot of injuries when your training load is that high and then when you're playing like that like 100 percent during the game like players like kritzoff and robert taylor like they they all got like muscle injuries um because of like how because of their load their training load and the game load um so it's like, and they're, they're giving it 110%. So it's like, they're bound to get injured and have like a muscle strain, muscle injury. At this point, anybody that isn't, oh no, I already read that. No, just two per club. It's three per club. Pretty sure it's three per club. Because I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, when Inter Miami sign uh first started they had um they had Iwai Matuidi and Pisaro. I'm pretty sure Pisaro was a DP. Was the Yeah it is three. Major League Soccer franchises sign up to up to three that would be considered outside their salary cap either by offering a player higher wages or by paying a transfer fee for the player. Yeah. Yeah, we're one of the highest. I'm looking at a chart right now. We're one of the highest clubs. Highest spending clubs. 
in the league when it comes to the DPs. I think we have 27 million in total. I think it was 20, 27.3 million. And I think the one right below us is, is, is Toronto. Because Toronto have... Um, I think it's Toronto. Because Toronto have like Insigne and, and Bernadeschi and whatever. It's three per club, but you can lose one for an under 22, something like that. Yeah, like if you can lose, you can... If you don't have it... Uh, if you don't use your third DP slot, you can have like an extra U22 player. So, yeah, it's, um, I don't know, but anyway, uh, what was the next thing I was going to talk about? We talked about Tata, we talked about Matias Rojas, we talked about Drake Callender, we talked about the team against Monterrey. Let's, okay, let's, let's shift, let's shift to Sporting Kansas City. Let's shift to Sporting Kansas City. Let's shift to um, how we should be lining up. We'll do a little scouting report on them. I have a, um, I have an article or their kind of preview, right? With a bunch of notes and, and whatnot. So let's switch over to this. So tomorrow, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, we're playing against Sporting Kansas City. Currently in the Western Conference, they sit 7th. This is how they performed in the last three games. They took a loss against the LA Galaxy. They beat Toronto, which isn't impressive. The Portland Timbers is a 3-3 draw. That is impressive because... Well, not impressive, but that's like... Okay. Um, They beat the San Jose Earthquakes. That's not impressive. And they tied to LAFC, which is impressive. So they had a pretty, they had a decent schedule. They had a decent schedule when it comes to uh, the level of competitiveness. Uh, LA Galaxy, LAFC, San Jose, I'm pretty sure are doing pretty bad. And the Portland Timbers are doing okay with Phil Neville uh, leading the helm in his first season there. Toronto, I'm pretty sure are doing pretty bad this season again. Uh, let me, no, that's Supporter Shield. Where is Toronto? Oh, they're doing... Uh, they're in seventh. All right. They're not... Actually, not doing that bad. Um, And yeah, and that's our form. We haven't won... Damn, how long has it been since we actually won a game? Lost 4 nothing, Tied 1-1. One, one, lost 2-1. Two, tied 2-2. Two, two, lost 3-1. When was the last time Inter-Miami's won a game? The last time Inter-Miami's won a game... It was against DC. At DC. At uh, Audi Field. And we won 3-1. Yeah, I remember covering that game. I'm pretty sure Su Suarez scored a brace or something. Yeah. That was a good game. We were on a good... We were on a decent run, honestly. Until we took... Then we took that Montreal loss. That was a bad loss. We should not have lost that game. And then after this Red Bull loss, we just kind of been downhill. After losing 4-0 against the Red Bulls, we've just been absolutely downhill. So, yeah. And we don't have an easy schedule either. We have Sporting KC. Then we have Nashville at home. New England. Red Bulls again. Montreal again. Orlando again. And then DC again. So, we pretty much play all the opponents that we've played so like already. We're playing them again. It's going to be uh it's going to be crazy. But this is the this is the the preview that Sporting Kansas City has uh, released for tomorrow's game. They call it by the numbers. Um, so yeah, just a couple of key things to talk about. They're really hyping this game up because it's Messi coming to town, right? And so they want to sell a lot of tickets. They're going to be playing at the Kansas City Chiefs Stadium for the first time in, like, I don't know how many years. Uh, they say that this is the one of the most anticipated matches of the club's 28-year history. Kickoff is 730 CT. Uh, they, they face the likes of the Messi. You see, like they kind of they promote the game, right? Because of Messi's coming and whatever. Uh, yeah. So this is the inaugural meeting between Sporting and Miami. Um, 
Oh, no, the, the inaugural meeting between Sporting and Miami took place on September 9, 2023 at Chase Stadium, Florida. Uh, Miami earned a 3-2 home, 3-2 win at home behind a Leonardo Campana brace and a Facundo Faria strike. Sporting uh, bookend the book ended. This uh, doesn't matter. An MLS club from Miami is playing in Kansas City for the first time since Miami Fusion lost 3 0 to Kansas City Wizards in the MLS Cup playoffs in 2001. This is the first time Miami is going to Kansas City um, in a really long time. A, a Miami soccer club. So yeah, so this this is the their record right now. So one in Kansas City is two two one and four seventh in the West. That's pretty bad, right? And in, in, uh, what in seven games? That's really really bad. Two one and four home record. They've only won once at home out of four games in the last five matches. They're two one and two. So that's not a bad that that's not terrible, right? For the last five games. Um. And yeah, so they'll play at Geha Field at Arrowhead Stadium for the first time since 2008, which was the club's home uh, home stadium for the first 12 MLS seasons, 1996 to 2007. Kansas City posted whatever on the regular season. Um, does it talk anything about players? Uh, Sporting has taken two. Okay, this is a this is a good fact. So Sporting has taken two nothing leads in three straight matches since March 23rd, and three O leads since in each of their last two matches against toronto on march 30th and portland on on april 7th so pretty much sporting likes to play okay so if that's the case right because they've been tying and losing a lot of their games so what it sounds like is that they just take the lead early in the game let's see how they did it yeah so they they literally took a three nothing lead against the Portland Timbers. They literally took a three nothing lead against the Portland. Is it seventeenth, thirteenth minute, forty fifth minute, and thirty eighth minute in the first half? Then the Portland Timbers came back and tied it three three with two goals in two minutes, a pen and a goal in the sixty sixth minute, and then Miller scored in the eighty first minute. Kamal Miller, former Inter Miami player, by the way. So that's that's a good sign for us because Inter Miami they never, not that we never. But it's. I think we're better off in the in the later in the later forty five minutes. Where is that article that I had? There we go. Um, uh, tied for second in the MLS with six shots on target per match. So they get a lot of shots on target. So yeah, I don't know. Agada has scored or assisted in each of Sporting last three matches since making his first start on March twenty third. Agada, that's not it. We're gonna close that out. I got this their striker who scored two of the goals um, against Portland. We're going to close that out too. Amongst the players, 15, uh, defender Danny Rosero uh, scored Sporting's second goal on Sunday's draw against Portland. He scored five of Sporting's eight headed goals since the 2023 season, coming all of a set pieces. So, set pieces. That's going to be interesting. So, if, if they, if, if they play for set pieces, if Sporting Kansas City play for set pieces and they get a good amount on us, they're probably going to score a lot. They're probably going to score maybe three goals if that's the case. Because if they're going to come off with the heat, if they're going to come off and pressure, 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 attack, 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 and they're going to get set pieces off, and they're, if they're going to find Denny Barrocero, they're going to score goals. They're going to, we're, we're definitely going to get, we're, it's probably going to be like a Portland game, especially at home. Um, Rosero has scored all five of his goals for sporting off headers since joining. Wow. Uh, goalkeeper Tim Melia is tied for third in MLS with 27 saves. So, I mean, they could be hyping their boys up right now. But so far, this, this is scary, right? This is scary for Inter-Miami. Just based off these stats and just based off what the club has said about their players. 27 saves in the MLS so far this season. Um, Rosero has scored all of his goals, scored five goals off of headers since early, since joining in early 2020. So like, I mean, it's been a year, right? But I mean, Hey, with our luck, he's going to, they're going to be playing set pieces and they're going to be finding Rosero in the box and he's going to score a header, right? That's just with our luck. So Rosero, we have to look out for, we have to look out for their striker, Agada. Um, 
Agada has 12 goals in 11 regular season home starts since joining in 2022. Um, and then this talks a little bit about us. And then this is just some milestone things that really don't matter. Like starts like 50th appearance, 200 appearance and that all doesn't matter. So yeah. If we're going to play well against Sporting Kansas City, they play the 4-4-3. At least that's what they played last time out against Portland Timbers. Um, when they lost to Galaxy, was it also against the 4-3-3? No, when they lost to Galaxy, they actually played with a 4-2-3-1 formation with two CDMs and two wingers. Um, let me actually show you guys what I'm looking at here. So yeah, they played 4-3-3 and they took this one against San Jose, right? But then... With this against the LA Galaxy, they played a 4-2-3-1 and lost. I mean, barely lost. I mean, they, they lost literally in the second. They lost in the second half again. They took a 2-0 lead up. And the Galaxy scored three goals in eight minutes. Pui getting man of the match with an absolute dog he that okay so it's like it's it's very interesting it's very interesting to look at so they genuinely just like playing a really good first half right they just like playing a really good first half and then they completely fumble it in the second half so if we can strategize and like I say that as we've been talking shit about Tata this entire time, right? But if Tata can plan something to where that th they can hold off, maybe, the, I mean, if they can get the lead in the first half, that'd be great. But if if Sporting Kansas City are, are going to be gassed by the second half, we actually have a chance of winning this game. The last time we played, we won 3-2, right? But that was at home. Was it in the second half? No, we they scored first, but we took the lead. We kept the lead the entire game after they scored first. They were playing a 4 through 3 And I mean, their team looks a bit different, right? So. I mean, hey, man. Sporting Kansas City are going to be playing their full starting 11. They're not going to be holding back. They're not going to be resting anybody. Uh, and especially when it's against Miami. And like, if, if Messi is going to be playing, if Suarez is going to be playing, if like, if we're going to have our full starting 11, it's going to be, they're, they're not going to hold back at all. So. It's it's gonna be very dangerous for us. I um Redondo's still out on an injury until probably next month. Uh Taylor, I don't think he's gonna be coming back. Like none of our players are going to be back by this game. Like the ones who are already injured. Um Robbie Robinson should be coming back soon. I don't know if he'll be back by this month, but they're they're slowly keeping an eye on him. Yannick Bright also should be uh, making his comeback soon. Um I feel like I'm not in focus. Am I in focus? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then crits off as well. So I don't know. I'm still I'm still gonna be stand by what I said in terms of playing the four two four four two. If they're playing the four three three, I it like, there's just no way we could play a five three two. There's just no way we could play a five three two or three five two or whatever you want to call it. Like it just doesn't work. It it literally doesn't work. That's literally also what cost us the game against Monterey in the first leg. Is playing the when we got the red card and we switched to a five at the back formation. It completely, it completely lost us the midfield battle. Um, if we can have three midfielders, that'd be great. If we even with the four four two, it'll be more structured in terms of the midfield because then the wingers would would be further in or. And I mean, it depends on how, I don't know how wide that field is going to be. So I don't know. It doesn't matter. But yeah, in my opinion, Franco Neg for the starting 11 against uh, Sporting Kansas City, Negri, Freire, I don't want to play Aviles. I don't want to play. I'd rather play Noah Allen instead of Aviles. Aviles, Aviles had a bad game against, against Monterrey, in my opinion. I would much rather, I would much rather have Freire play with uh, Noah Allen or somebody else. I don't know. Uh, let me let me pull up the, the game from last time out. Hold on. 
much rather play Allen and Freire with Cello and Negri. Let me actually go back to what was the game that we played? The what was it like a four? Oh my god, four four like two. It was Colorado. This with this setup, I mean, obviously not exactly right, but Negri Allen, maybe not Sailor. I mean, you could probably play Sla Sailor. He didn't play last. He didn't play bad last time out, right? Negri Allen Stale Ruiz. Instead, you can do Negri Allen Freire Cello. Put Gomez in there. Put Sergio Busquets in there. And then put Gressel. On the left, put Jordi Alba. Put Jordi Alba on the left. Put Jordi Alba on the left. Put Suarez up top. Put Messi on the right. If Messi doesn't want to play, put Afonso on the left. Put uh, Jordi Alba on the right. Play Gresso on the right and play another midfielder. Put in Kremaski. Put in... um, Play Ruiz or something. I don't know. Play another midfielder. I we if we shift if we move those players around and we and we shift them around into other positions that they can actually play we we can win the game. We can literally we can win the game and we can play good. We do, we also want to see good football. Like it, even if I feel like even if we lost against Monterrey, if we show that we put a valuable effort, like a valuable effort, we we played good football and we still lost, it's okay. Like okay, like we can deal with it because we played very very well. But if we're losing and we're just playing like ass, it it it's just it's not good, man. It's just it just it's frustrating. It's very very frustrating. So yeah, I don't know. But that's gonna be for that's gonna be tomorrow at eight thirty p.m. Eastern time, seven thirty Central. Um. I was gonna do a watch along, but I'm not. I'm not sure. Because I do work tomorrow, so I'm not sure what time I'm actually going to get home from work in order to be able to uh, actually do like a watch along type of thing. But if anything, the podcast is still going to like I'm still going to be live after the game to do my match review um, and just talk about the performance. Hopefully, I'll, I'm going to be like tweeting throughout the game, just kind of my thoughts and opinions of of what's going on and things like that. And then we'll recap it all with the a post game review uh afterwards so uh but that's going to be the end of the so flow soccer the herons haven podcast thank you so much for watching and and uh joining in tuning in to this podcast it was pretty early podcast on this uh friday hope everybody enjoys their weekend tomorrow miami plays football i'll see you then have a great rest of your day and i hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend take care guys take care take care